Okay, so while we wait for a few more minutes for people to come in, uh, I will give a brief introduction of our speaker today. Welcome to the Photonic Innovation Center, the OSA and SPIE student chapter sponsored seminar. Uh, today, the title of the seminar is Microcombs Unifying the Optoelectronic Spectrum at the Chip Scale. And we're very delighted to have Professor Kerry Bahala here today um, to give this talk. Kerry Bahala is the Jenkins Professor and Professor of Applied Physics at Caltech. And he's best known for his research in ultra low loss, uh, which are also known as ultra high Q optical microresonators and their applications. So these, these uh, resonators, these ultra high Q resonators used to be very large or they were formed by bulk optics. But over the years, his group has miniaturized these devices so that they are in a chip scale form factor. And that um, opened up many new areas of physics and applications. Uh, because the circulating intensities in the um, chip scale micro resonators, these ultra high resonators, were much higher than in the free space ones. So some applications that these uh, micro resonators have found uh, are include laser sources, uh, optical frequency references, microwave sources, quantum optics. And prior to his ultra high Q resonator work, he was very well known for his work on quantum well lasers and their noise and dynamic properties. He has been recognized with numerous awards, uh, including the IEEE Sarnoff Award, the OSA Paul Foreman Team Engineering Excellence Award for a two photon optical clock, the NASA Achievement Award for the application of frequency combs to the exoplanet search, uh, the Alexander von Humboldt Award. He's a fellow of the IEEE and the OSA. And last year in 2020, he was elected into the National Academy of Engineering. And Personally, I've known Kerry for nearly 20 years. <laughs> I, I, he was my professor in a quantum electronics course at Caltech uh, back in 2002. Uh, he was an excellent teacher. His quantum electronics class was very technical, in fact, um, and uh, really prepared all of us to enter the field of photonics and nonlinear optics and laser physics. And for me personally, it's also been very amazing to see how this field of high Q resonators really blossomed um, during my, my time as a PhD researcher to, to now as sort of a professional researcher. So from the early 2000s to when I was a PhD student, his group was working on these um, very, very exquisite uh, microsphere resonators and the erbium lasers, microsphere lasers that came out of that and then that evolved into toroids and then wedges and, and now um, the various uh, form factors that are now even uh, fabricated with lithography um, procedures, processes. So they can be made on silicon and at wafer scale. So um, again, I'm just so happy that Carrie's here again today. He last visited Toronto almost 10 years ago. Um, with that, uh, I'm sure he'll tell us more about his new research. Uh, lots has changed in the past decade. So uh, I pass the floor to you, Kerry. No, thank you very much, uh, Joyce. And uh, yeah, for the, you know, great introduction overview. And um, I'm really happy to you know, be back, uh, even virtually, okay, at the University of uh, Toronto. It's uh, you know, been just about 10 years. And, um, and good, good timing. It gives me a chance, as you were just sort of mentioning, to uh, kind of uh, bring everyone up to date on what's been happening with uh, uh, optical uh, micro cavities. And, and so, as you said, there's a lot that's been going on. There's you know, many different application areas that are being studied. Um, the one I'm going to focus on today is one that has really heated up in the last five years. And uh, this is the subject of uh, frequency microcombs uh, that belong to a you know, broader class of, of uh, devices that are you know, frequency combs, which I'll be telling you a little bit about. Um, the overall theme today, though, the message I want to uh, leave you with, and I'll kind of start with that message, explain what I mean by this, and then I'll return to it at the end of the talk, is the idea of uh, spectral unification and uh, you know, unification of the optoelectronic spectrum and how microcombs are really transitioning us uh, you know, to this uh, kind of capability, new capability, but at the chip scale. And at, at the very end of the talk, I'll kind of uh, discuss how this you know, might unfold and impact uh, technology in the coming decades. So, um, so let's start and uh, begin by first 
giving you an idea of what I mean by spectral unification uh, through several well-known examples that we, you know, perhaps we don't think of it this way, but these are, you know, technologies where uh, we run across in the lab, uh, you know, everyday life uh, that actually rely upon spectral unification at audio, radio, and microwave rates. And then after, you know, kind of laying that uh, definition, I uh, will then, you know, discuss the, the frequency chrome technology. And, and uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, quite a remarkable, uh, you know, feat that it performs. It is actually spectrally unified uh, photonics and electronics. So I'll explain how it does that and, you know, some of the ways that uh, frequency comes have been applied. And then that'll lead me into the main part of the talk where I want to, uh, you know, discuss these little, uh, you know, miniature uh, frequency chromes that are now, you know, we can make them readily on a chip. Uh, you know, what's going to happen as a result of that? You know, what's the, what are the physical principles at work in these little films? And, uh, and then I'll finish up by talking about the kind of recent progress on integration. There's a tremendous amount of work in this area now. It's uh, really taken off a lot of groups and a lot of eyes, so to speak, are, you know, working the problem. So it's moving fast, a uh, very competitive field. And, uh, you know, so I'll show you some of these latest efforts on integration, system demonstrations, and then you know, how this is going to play out uh, near term, long term in the future. So that's kind of the roadmap for today. Um, all right, so first of all, what do I mean by spectral unification? And so I'm going to, I'm picking two examples that have a parallel uh, in the world of frequency combs. And so the first is something we're all, you know, we use these all the time. These are frequency synthesizers. Um, you know, they're uh, lab instruments that, you know, purchased from, you know, Keysight, Rody Schwartz, you know, there's a lot of different manufacturers. And uh, we don't really even think about them, you know, as that remarkable anymore. But, you know, they really are uh, quite a remarkable uh, tool. And if you've ever looked at the diagram for how a frequency synthesizer operates, I'm showing you, you know, one version. There's several different versions of this, but this is a version that um, is basically illustrating you know, the key parts that I want to uh, emphasize. And so there's two oscillators, all right? There's a reference oscillator you see there. Okay, if you can see my cursor. This is a low frequency oscillator, typically low frequency because the best reference oscillators we have now uh, that are low cost are quartz oscillators. They've been, you know, refined and perfected over many, many decades. And so these operate, you know, typically, you know, tens of megahertz. Um, but to generate uh, a wide range of frequencies out to the microwave, what happens is that in a synthesizer, you pair together this very nice reference with an, a very high frequency oscillator. So this is the voltage controlled oscillator you see over here. This could be a, like a YIG oscillator. So if you purchased a microwave synthesizer, um, then what you'd find typically inside is you'd have one of these little quartz devices and you'd have a YIG device and they work together. Uh, they coherently are you know, coupled together through a lot of other electronics. And that's what I'm showing here. There are dividers. There's typically also multipliers, but in this scheme, there's only dividers. And, um, and the idea is that, uh, you know, we, we are able to type in, you know, to some level of uh, precision, some large number of significant figures, of the frequency of a sine wave uh, that uh, should be generated by the synthesizer. And we, you know, push the button, and then the instrument, you know, produces the sine wave frequency that we like. And in this case, this is showing, you know, these uh, fractional or these ratios that can be produced as multiples of the, of the reference here up to the VCO frequency. And uh, I'm showing just a few examples of these sine waves. So this is a very familiar kind of a tool. And I'll come back to this in a moment in the optical context, but just to kind of hint at what the frequency comb is going to do, the frequency comb is basically playing the role of all of this electronics in between. And so it's really going to do this. And uh, so we're going to have we're going to come back again to these two oscillators over here, and um, but the the comb will be doing all the electronics. All right, so this is one example of unification, one familiar example where we're going from a low frequency to a high frequency. Let's look at another, and um, <clears throat> so this is another very familiar one, maybe less familiar now because um, you know wristwatches perhaps have you know somewhat gone away, but. You know, we rely upon, you know, phones, smartphones now for timekeeping. But, you know, not that long ago, uh, you know, this was a kind of a, a very, very inexpensive little quartz wristwatch, okay, that you could buy. This one I, I had and uh, disassembled it quite a long time ago. And, um, and so what I want to do is I want to illustrate 
or use it to illustrate how modern clocks operate. And so all clocks, which represent now kind of the reverse direction from what I just described in the synthesizer. So when the clock will start with a high frequency and then we will connect the high frequency down to a low frequency. In fact, the low frequency will be the second, right? So we'll want to create a, you know, a, a tick, okay, on a clock. And, uh, and so in the wristwatch, the way this works is that, I mean, here's the battery, here's the liquid crystal display. There's some electronics hidden behind the LCD that I'll come back to in a moment, and a little cylinder. And if you open the cylinder up very carefully, here's the, uh, you know, the quartz tuning fork, okay, that, you know, many years ago when, uh, you know, ads used to run about, you know, quartz precision, you know, in wristwatches, this was the little tuning fork that, you know, was providing the, uh, the accuracy and precision for the, the watch. And so the way this works, and again, this is how all clocks, even, even the atomic clock, the cesium time standard clock that is used you know, as the world time standard, they all work this way, that there's a reference, a high frequency reference, in this case, not that high a frequency, it's only, you know, it's two to the 15 hertz, two to the 15 hertz. And uh, so it's a little higher than audio, but the electronics divides. And so the, the, the electronic circuit, you know, series of counters will divide by two, you know, uh, 15 times. And then the output, okay, will produce a second. And the second, the you know, accuracy of the second depends on actually the ability to really do this, to machine these little quartz uh, tuning forks so that they vibrate, all right, at uh, 32,768 hertz. And then you can also see that, you know, the reliability or the accuracy of your wristwatch depends on, for example, like how temperature affects the tuning fork. And here you, you kind of rely upon body temperature, all right, to actually sort of maintain a, kind of a constant environmental bath that you know, maintains sort of the average frequency of the, of the tuning fork. But you know, if you're skiing or if you're at the beach, okay, obviously there's going to be a change in temperature. And so this is what causes some drift in your, in your wristwatch. So, so better, os or better clocks rely upon really you know, having uh, better references and, and better references you know, run it. You know, typically we've learned over many, many decades, better references are running at higher frequencies and higher cues. Okay, so that's, Kind of what I mean. That explains the idea of spectral unification in terms of two familiar examples, one going from low frequency to high frequency, the other going from high frequency to low frequency. So now let's turn the attention to unification, but on a, on a much, you know, kind of grander scale, all right, between optical frequencies and electronics. And, and again, this is what uh, frequency combs really do. So I'll come back to that in just a few charts. But uh, what I want to make clear, okay, is, you know, what, what am I not talking about, okay? Because, I mean, there's many different ways, many different, you know, technologies that we have available to coherently couple uh, light uh, with electronics. And, um, and so we are able to detect light waves that are modulated and turn those into electrical signals. We are able to, you know, take an electrical signal, uh, modulate a light wave, for example. So there is a back and forth, a very, very well-defined technology space that allows us to go back and forth and, and to connect in some sense, you know, electronic signals and optical signals. But that is not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is really this idea of, of real coherent connection, right? So the ability to divide optical signals, okay, at hundreds of terahertz all the way down to radio frequency rates, and then ultimately even to you know, be interested in producing a time standard for the second or the reverse, um, multiply, you know, electrical rates up to optical rates. And it's pretty obvious that this is a difficult thing to do, and it was until very recently, uh, you know, extremely difficult to do. And the, and the reason is just a huge gap in frequency between electronics and optics. Electronics simply cannot, you know, operate at, at optical rates, you know, where you're looking at, uh, you know, hundreds of terahertz okay, of rate. Uh, and so that's been, you know, I mean, that's, that's an obvious, uh, you know, gigantic hurdle, okay, so to speak, in uh, sort of having this sort of unification that we take for granted at, at audio, radio, and uh, microwave rates. Um, but what's kind of curious, and this just shows you, you know, um, you know human curiosity, uh, you know, very, very soon, okay, after the invention of the laser, and so in the, in the 60s, um, the laser in some sense, you can think of it intuitively as the optical, you know, equivalent or optical manifestation of um, radio and microwave oscillators. And, uh, and so it's producing sine waves, okay, and, you know, classical, you can think of the semi-classical waves, but they're you know, these nice electric, uh, electric field sine waves at high rates. 
And, uh, and so it was natural uh, just because by the 60s, synthesis had already appeared. In fact, the, the first commercial radio frequency synthesizers were beginning to appear uh, from companies like Hewlett Packard. And, uh, and so it, it started, you know, uh, scientists at that time thinking about, could you do the same thing with light fields? And uh, would it be possible to actually, you know, create a coherent link between a radio frequency system and an optical laser? Uh, or if you could do that, even maybe, you know, connect it up to an atom. And if you could do that, could you go in the other direction? So there were all kinds of, you know, interesting ideas that popped up as a result of having now an optical oscillator, okay, that would be the uh, analog of, of radio oscillators. And, uh, and this led, okay, to a, a four decade long, uh, you know, pursuit that was ultimately successful uh, at several laboratories around the world uh, to create what are called frequency chains. And uh, these are now really, you know, this is, these are devices from, uh, you can look at them, a bygone era, okay? So they, they were uh, highly complicated, very impractical, um, but, you know, uh, but, you know, kind of in some ways a, a, a brilliant idea. Uh, I'm showing you one of them that was successful here on the right. This was uh, demonstrated at the National Bureau of Standards in Boulder, Colorado. That's now NIST, okay, the National Institute of Standards and, Tech and Technology. Um, there were other chains, okay, that, you know, were developed. Uh, some of the most advanced ones were in Germany, actually, in the late, uh, in the late 90s. And they succeeded in actually making this coherent link. And, uh, and so as a result, a couple of you know, very significant scientific experiments were conducted. And so there was a period of time, for example, when the speed of light uh, was actually sort of verified to a higher level of precision um, by actually measuring very precisely the frequency of krypton and then coupling that with a precise measurement of the wavelength of krypton. And that, that measurement of the speed of light actually, you know, um, later gave way to actually the definition of the speed of light. Okay, so we now, speed of light is now defined and uh, the second is defined. And then that combination, or the second is the result of a cesium time standard and that combination allows us to define the meter. So there were a whole lot of interesting little chain reactions okay, that came about that are profound. I mean, they actually have impacted the way we think, you know, we do science today, you know, some of our standards because of the development of these frequency chains. But again, they were really, you know, you can tell they were, they occupied multiple laboratory bays and uh, you really couldn't en envision this ever being, you know, widely used, okay, widespread. But um, along with the chain work, there were also researchers that were trying to understand how could you miniaturize chains? And miniaturization at this level is not what I'm going to talk about in a moment, but we're going to a chip. This is miniaturization now going from, you know, something that's the size of a small building, okay, down to hopefully something that might be a rack mount instrument. And, um, and there were, you know, a couple of really, uh, you know, uh, important developments through the 90s that gave way, okay, to, you know, a really profound, uh, you know, invention, okay, 20 years ago, and that was uh, the frequency comb. And uh, the comb, frequency comb, really was invented and perfected at two labs. Okay, one was uh, MPQ uh, in uh, Garking, Germany, and this was uh, Ted Hench's group, and the other was Jan Hall's group in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And um, there's a series of papers that appeared just around, uh, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001, that completely set the stage and defined, okay, this uh, subject that still is uh, having amazing impact, okay, all across photonics. I think, in my mind, this is probably the most important optical invention in the last 25 years. Uh, I mean, if you really dig into what it's done, and I hope to, maybe just from what I, the, the little brief description I'll give you in a moment, maybe you'll begin to see why I, I, I can say that. Uh, but what a comb does is it really does, it gives us this bi-directional connection that, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier. It's this unification, but now on a much uh, bigger landscape, you know, we're connecting together optical frequencies at hundreds, you know, of terahertz with electronic frequencies. And we can go back and forth and we can do this very conveniently. And these are now commercial devices that, you know, are about the size of a shoebox. And, uh, and so we've gone from lab base down to a shoebox. And, um, and how have we done that? Well, the other kind of remarkable part of the story is that it uses a very, you know, kind of a well-established uh, tool in, uh, in optics, and that is the mode lock laser that, you know, was really 
uh, the idea of mode locking came about in the 60s. And, um, and so I'm showing a, you know, kind of an animation that I borrowed from one of my uh, uh, friends, Scott Didums, of a titanium sapphire mode lock laser. And so there's many longitudinal modes in this cavity. They are uh, you know, phase locked together to produce these ultra short pulses. Um, now, it's kind of hard to imagine how this would you know, allow us to you know, uh, you know, make this bidirectional link. So let me just kind of go through you know, kind of real quick hand wavy explanation. Um, so the output, if we look at it in the optical spectrum, so the Fourier space of these little pulses, they're periodic pulses, and so there's a set of lines, okay, that correspond to the modes of this uh, cavity. And, um, and what is done, okay, the, the core, the key idea that takes a conventional mode lock laser and turns it into a modern frequency comb is a process called self-referencing. And self-referencing is really the core of the Nobel Prize, or half the Nobel Prize. And, uh, and here's the idea, is that each of these comb lines can be given a label, F sub n, where n is the index, an integer index. The repetition rate, that's something we can easily measure. Put a photo detector at the eye, it produces a periodic current. But it turns out that in order to measure the frequencies of the comb, and that's what we, we really want to do, this is what's called self-referencing, uh, we need one other number. We need this F0 number, and this F0 number, you can think of it's like a fictitious comb, no, comb line that would be the n equals zero comb line. There's no energy down there, but you know, pretend that it's there, okay, anyway. So how do you measure that? And how do you turn it into an electrical current? Well, there's a couple of steps involved. The first step is broaden the spectrum of the pulses. So the pulses are broadened out to over an octave, right? So this is supposed to be an octave, right? Here, my little hand-drawn spectrum. Take a few of the comb lines at the low frequency end here and double them using a you know, nonlinear crystal Compare those now, you know, their replicas, to these high frequency lines that are out here at the other end of the uh, comb spectrum after it's been doubled. And the beat frequency, you can show really quickly, just a line of algebra uh, gives you F0. So F0, through this little process of self-referencing, can be measured, turned into an electrical current, and then you can use that to servo control the cavity so that now F rep and F0 uh, can be stabilized to like a radio frequency source, you know, like a piece of quartz, for example, or even better, a maser. And then all of the lines of the comb are now established. And literally, you know, we literally know where they are, modulo, okay, the line spacing into the comb. So with a little bit of help from a radium monochromator or an atomic line, uh, you will then be able to know where a given comb frequency is, all right, to an incredible and unprecedented level of, of precision. And so this, just this little idea alone um, actually launched a whole you know, new you know, category of high precision spectroscopy, even new techniques for doing spectroscopy. But this is only one part of the story, right? So this is kind of uh, a picture that shows you, you know, what else can be done with a, uh, with a comb. And, uh, and so here I'm showing a Fabry-Perot cavity instead of a Tysaf cavity. And, uh, these are supposed to be the modes, the longitudinal modes, and so here you can see the little equation for the nth frequency. Uh, we're envisioning that these modes are locked and they're producing these little pulses that are emitted out this mirror. So whenever the repetition rate would be the period of these pulses, these pulses are not shown as being very narrow, but you know they, in principle, would be you know very narrow. They'd be femtosecond timescale pulses. All right. So the mode of operation that I just described, all right. So the self-reference mode, where you input radio frequency signals, stabilize F rep, stabilize F stereo. That is represented, okay, down here through this kind of mechanical analogy of what the comb is doing. And so here is the input radio frequency signal. It drives this little microwave here. And what literally happens, what the comb is doing is it's transferring coherently, you know, in a completely coherent sense, okay, the radio frequency control all the way up simultaneously all to, these, or to all of these lines. And there's about, a, you know, there can be hundreds of thousands of these lines, a million of these lines, depending upon the comb repetition rate that are spanning this, you know, this octave. And so this is what we call synthesis, okay? So this is this mode one below. But as I said, there's two other modes of operation. And this is, again, why this, you know, device is so, has had such huge impact. Uh, you can go the other way. All right, it's bidirectional. So rather than specifying the microwave frequency, specify one of the comb lines. And so how do you do that? Well, this comb line could be locked to a very stable reference cavity, or even better, it could be stabilized to a very long-lived dipole transition 
in a cold atom or in a lattice of atoms, a lattice of cold atoms. And if you do that, then what happens is that now that amazing optical stability is coherently transferred down to an electrical signal that can be detected. This is just the pulse rate of the the comb. Detect the pulse rate from the comb, divide that down further using electronics. You now have the basis for now what are the most accurate clocks Okay, no, and these are 100 times more accurate than the current cesium time standard, and they will become the future time standard. All right, and then finally, the third mode of operation, this is one that really has a lot of scientific importance, is that a, you, the whole system, it can be configured so that it's possible to transfer coherence between, you know, two of these lines that extend over an octave. And so this has become really interesting in comparing, uh, you know, with incredibly high accuracy, transitions in different atoms or the accuracy of different styles of optical clocks. And so there's, again, kind of these three different modes of operation. Okay, so coming back again to the big theme, all right, so we have the, uh, the synthesis, which I originally described as you know, quartz to radio, quartz to microwave, and now the synthesis is occurring, okay, radio to optical. And I'm just showing two comb teeth here. And then the other direction, okay, is division. And uh, this would be the clock, okay, style. So this, would, this is formally equivalent to the wristwatch clock. But now starting with, for example, a cold atom or a cold atomic lattice, divide these transitions down. And you have to remember what re really is going on here is that the cycles of oscillation of the atomic dipole are literally being counted. And they're being counted and divided down to produce you know, electrical signals that then establish a new definition of the standard. And, and by the way, this is not only the basis for the best clocks, but this is a kind of important, I would say, victory, okay, for photonics that, uh, you know, the very, very, you know, best microwave and radio frequency oscillators that are now known are uh, basically, you know, they use this principle of what's called optical frequency division. They're, they're vastly more stable, okay, than kind of the previous gold standard, okay, which was based on, on sapphire. So in the future, uh, you know, it's really clear, I think, after maybe after the talk today, that, you know, on some time scale, we will have, you know, very, very stable radio microwave electrical oscillators, but the core of those devices will be optical. And, uh, and so that's, you know, one other impact of all of this. Okay. All right. So now with that, let's kind of move on and look at miniaturization. And so there's several steps that I want to go through. First of all, let's talk about the physics and uh, what we need to do, and then we'll look at integration. All right, so come back to this basic picture. So this is the last 20 years of uh, frequency comb technology, tabletop combs, and, and, uh, and so you know, I've kind of gone through these steps a little bit, but here's the mode locking process, which today actually in a commercial device is most often done with a, a mode locked fiber laser. All right, so really you know, powerful technology in its own right. Um, here's a uh, nonlinear optical fiber uh, that's used to broaden this, all right? So this are, these are special fibers that really came into existence around the year 2000, same year as the invention of the frequency comb. And we've got uh, some nonlinear optics needed to actually self-reference the device. All right, so these are key things we need to do and transfer over to a chip to create a comb. All right, so today I'm gonna spend really all the time, okay, talking about the first part of this, the uh, how we create very stable mode locked, you know, systems, okay, on a chip that are stable enough that they have not now moved very rapidly into full, you know, chip-based comb systems. But, you know, if we had more time, all right, I could tell you about you know, all of the other pieces, the ingredients here, because they're, they're, they're interesting in their own right. There just isn't enough time to talk about them today. So the octospan generation, amazingly the octospan generation, we don't use optical fiber. The octospan is actually done inside the little resonator that's going to generate the frequency comb. And uh, so we get mode locking octospan, all right, right out of the little device. A um, Couple of other features, detectable repetition rates, the harmonic generation, the detectors, the amplifiers, not surprisingly, those are already available on chip. But the, the point is, and I'll show you this a little later with some, uh, you know, actual demonstrations, you know, everything is now on a chip and now it's not a matter of, you know, getting it onto a chip, it's a matter of just continuing to refine, okay, the integration and, and uh, that's moving incredibly quickly. 
All right, so let's talk about the physics, all right? Just what goes into the, the mode locking process. That's what I want to uh, really uh, turn attention to in the next few charts. So, so Joyce kind of you know, talked about this a little bit uh, in the introduction, but um, the uh, devices, with, ex with the exception of one particular device that are used now for uh, these microchromes are whispering gallery resonators. So very, very high key whispering gallery resonators. And there's a whole range of, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting subject in its own right, just you know, kind of fascinating to look at all the different ways that groups are manufacturing and fabricating whispering gallery resonators. Some of them are discrete. Like over here, this is sort of semi-discrete. Some of them are fully integrated. There's versions I'll show you later that are very new that they're completely fabricated now on uh, on CMOS lines. Like they literally CMOS lines, and um, and uh, we're now you know using those. Um, but they all have in common that light is guided in a little ring orbit, and so I'm kind of showing that down here. Here's the little ring orbit in this little silica microtorid. Uh, there's a round trip condition. It's necessary to pack in an integer number of wavelengths and material that sets up, you know, the resonant frequency spectrum. And so the, in the end, each of these little whispering gallery resonators has a round trip condition and they support, you know, a, approximately equally spaced set of, of modes. There's dispersion in there. So the modes are not perfectly equally spaced, but, but there are, you, know, you can think of them as kind of like a spec, like a comb spectrum. All right. So now, it's easy to make these devices. I mean, it really is. If you have access to a, uh, to a, a fabrication facility, um, it's, you, know, you can readily make some little uh, whispering gallery resonators on a chip. Um, but the next step is harder. And uh, 20 years ago, it was super hard. 10 years ago, it was hard. Today, it's gotten a lot easier. There's a lot of tricks okay, that have been developed to do this. Um, but the Q has to be high. And uh, the Q has to be high uh, because we, we want to have strong resonant enhancement of coupled light into a small mode volume. And as Joyce was mentioning, if you do this, it's kind of remarkable what happens, but uh, the circulating intensity will scale like Q over V. And uh, so if we look at that little toric, for example, um, then, you know, not, you know, not a lot of power, power that's readily available from, uh, you know, telecommunications lasers, 3-5 uh, lasers, uh, will generate huge circulating intensities. Um, even the absolute powers are large, right? So the, the power in a microtorid like this that you know, has a, a Q in the hundreds of million, um, if you're launching tens of milliwatts in, you can actually get to kilowatts, okay, of circulating, circulating power, continuous power. And so all of a sudden, nonlinear optical effects that would typically require, you know, a lot of, you know, tabletop laser power, okay, to access are accessible using, you know, you know, little tiny, you know, chip-based lasers. And so this is really, you know, you know, part of the story here. And the, if I pull out one of the nonlinearities, okay, in fact, this is the key nonlinearity that is used to make these new microcombs, the care nonlinearity. There's a couple of aspects of the care nonlinearity I want to go through in a little detail here of the physics that allow us to mode lock and uh, leveraging this high circulating intensity. And so this is one part of it. Um, and the care effect, uh, you know, again, it's a third order nonlinearity. And so one way you can think about it is that it's taking pump light, you know, that will provide pump photons, two pump photons scatter elastically through this nonlinearity, exchange energy. There's a, a signal and idler, okay, that are produced as a result of this. And the cavity, that basic interaction leads to gain. Okay, so it's, it's gain very much like what we're used to thinking about in a stimulated you know, emission sense or a two-level system. But this is coherent gain. This is a gain that results from a parametric uh, process, not a stimulated process. But it still leads to threshold. So there's a, it's a thresholding process and it's a you know, regenerative oscillator. But it's a little it's a little different from what we're normally used to thinking of in lasers. You have this pair, okay, so we have a pair, a signal idler pair, and the pair begin to oscillate as a result of, of pumping. And importantly, the signal idler pair are about equidistant in frequency from the pump as a result of the fact that the scattering process is elastic. All right? So now coming back to the threshold, the turn on power, okay, Q helps us a lot here. So high Q. Uh, actually the Q enters inverse quadratically to the threshold, the turn on power for this little oscillator that we have. And you can see the numbers are really low. So this was data taken quite a long time ago in a microtoroid. 
but it's pretty typical, okay, even today, of the turn on power for, uh, you know, to achieve parametric uh, gain and oscillation. Now, why is parametric gain and oscillation important in microcombs? Well, it turns out this is the process that we, we use to actually drive the comb. And uh, in fact, the, the combs turn on, okay, at this threshold power. And so you, you wanna be paying close attention to Q uh, because Q is going to make it easier, okay, to turn on these combs. Now, how do the combs actually form? Well, this is an interesting story as well. So here's the parametric oscillator. You'll see these extra little lines that are appearing over here. Well, these are the results of mixing, third order mixing that's now occurring between these three lines, okay, once they form. And we started to see this effect, okay, you know, right at the same time as, you know, the parametric oscillation. And in fact, if you pumped it hard, okay, you could see a whole set of lines through a process called cascaded uh, forward mixing. Now, the, the uh, person that connected the dots, okay, on this, and actually sort of coined the term microcomb for this was uh, Tobias Kippenberg. So a couple of years after this, he was involved in this early parametric oscillation work and then later um, tested out a, in a very broad cascaded comb like this and showed that you could make it operate and function, okay, as a kind of a comb on a chip. And so this created a tremendous amount of interest, obviously, because if you could put comb technology, which by 2007 was already you know, becoming pretty well developed, if you could put it on a chip, you know, that would be a very big thing. And so there were a lot of groups, okay, that uh, jumped in and started looking at these devices. Um, it became clear pretty soon that there was some missing ingredient, okay, that uh, we didn't have here. And um, in fact, you know, sometimes the combs would come up and they would be, you know, coherent and sometimes they would come up and they would be noisy. And uh, the missing ingredient kind of fell into place uh, a number of years later and uh, this was pulse formation. So what, it, what we think of as sort of true mode locking in the sense of when I think of mode locking or probably when most of us think of mode locking and a laser, we think of formation of sh short pulses. And uh, in other words, phase aligning all the modes of the cavity so that we can actually produce a you know, short femtosecond timescale pulse. And, and that you know, really is a, an essential ingredient. It was brought in okay, uh, in 2014 and it really was an important, it was a critical turning point in the subject. And I think, you know, a lot of the key ideas have come into place uh, since 2014. And so I'm showing you a couple of the early reports here, 2014, 2015, 2016. Some of the key papers were, were beginning to actually do true mode locking, okay, uh, you know, based on, you know, this, uh, this care, okay, nonlinearity. And these are representative spectra, they're optical spectra, um, in some cases, you can see the comb lines. Other cases, the comb lines are too close together to resolve. But uh, the kind of comb spectrum that's produced here has the shape of a hyperbolic even square in the spectrum and uh, produces a you know, nice little you know, uh, pulse. All right, so what is the pulse itself? Well, uh, again, continuing kind of the physics here for just a, a few charts. The pulse is a soliton, as it turns out, and the idea for this new type of uh, coherently pumped soliton uh, was actually proposed theoretically a long time ago. Uh, there was a paper in the early 90s, okay, that actually, you know, uh, indicated that you could do this. Uh, in fact, by the early 90s, we were already studying, you know, fiber solitons. That was a super hot subject, okay. In the 90s, it remains a very hot subject today, but in the early 90s, it was still even thought of as a possible way to send information, okay, over long distances. Um, but those types of solitons used, you know, the care nonlinearity to form the soliton, but they did not actually come with their own kind of gain. And, uh, and so that was the difference here, the, uh, this new kind of coherent pump soliton. Um, it took many years, okay, before actually those solitons were seen. It was some 17 years later before they were first observed, and this was in optical fiber. And then it was four years after that until they transitioned into the micro cavities and you know, gave us the really the modern uh, microcomb, okay, soliton microcomb. And um, I want to just tell you a little bit about, you know, the, again, a little more physics. Uh, this is actually the equation of motion, right, for these new solitons. And so it's called the Lugiano Lefebvre equation. The part that I'm outlining here is really a part that if you study solitons and optical fiber, you're probably very familiar with it. It's a kind of a nonlinear Schrodinger type equation. There's a a second order dispersion term here. We could actually add higher order dispersion terms. Theta is the coordinate 
of the soliton as it's going around the cavity in this case. Here's the care effect. And the care effect is actually compensating the dispersion, right? So that's one of its jobs. Uh, but the new terms are over here. Okay, so here's a loss term. This is something that's a little bit new. And that loss term is a tribute or is coming from, you know, the cavity losses, absorption, scattering, the uh, intentional coupling of the soliton out the cavity. And, uh, and because of this coherent amplification that we have, that loss is actually compensated. So the care effect is compensating loss, compensating dispersion. And so this is a mode locked, you know, parametric oscillator, all right, in the end. It, it's you know, quite a different animal, okay, than the, um, you know, the predecessors, which were the soliton you know, mode locking devices that relied upon, for example, erbium fiber, okay, amplifiers to provide their gain. These come with their own built-in gain. Here's the pumping term that's giving us that gain. This is the field, the input field, and that's also going to be one of the home lines in the end because this is a coherent process. And I want to tell you a little bit about how you turn on the laser and how you turn or how you turn on the solitons. And so this is a detuning frequency here, okay, that uh, this delta omega and omega zero is the frequency of one of the whispering gallery modes that we're going to pump. And this is the pump frequency of the field, okay, that's doing the pumping. And to kind of understand how we you know, get the solitons going, I'm going to again look at the resonant buildup. And so here's intracavity power. Here's the detuning frequency, delta omega. When delta omega is equal to zero, that means omega p is equal to zero. We're right on resonance. So if the care effect were zero or if the cavity q were low, all that we would see is this gray curve and resonance would go up and down. But as the q increases and the care or the care effect is enhanced, um, this will pitch over. And then what you'll see here is that there's going to be a region of bistability. And I've colored in this region in the back, and this is where the solitons will form. And so in the laboratory, what happens is that if the pumping laser is scanned, so if we scan to make P, and we have to scan it from blue to red, all right, this has to be positive because of the sign of the care nonlinearity coefficient G. But if we do that, we would start to ride up that bistability curve at some point, it, the laser would drop down. There would appear this little step. And this is data over here where we're actually doing that. This is a time scan, but you've got to think that the laser is actually scanning from blue to red. So it rises up the bisability curve, it drops down, and then there's a step. And the step is actually the manifestation of a soliton. And so just to show you how that works, this is data that uh, is taken using a very, very high speed sampling system, coherent sampling system. And we're going to observe, in this case, solitons, these little currently pumped solitons form inside this little wedge resonator. This is a silica resonator. And this little ring, I want you to watch this ring. And the ring is going to be showing us the data in which as we scan the pump, okay, we're gonna go from red or from blue to red, but now we're monitoring actually the transmitted power, right? So this is kind of the reverse of what I had on the previous chart. This is the transmitted power as we come into resonance past the whispering gallery resonator. And so I'm gonna turn on the pump, we begin to scan the pump. As we come into resonance, we're now seeing all of this, what I call noisy comb. I mentioned this noisy comb before. This is the cascaded forward mixing. And then as we eventually get to the, over here, we'll enter the bistability regime and now you see four solitons, but we continue to scan and now we'll see three, two, one, zero, all right? And so in this case, you can only see that we can put one soliton in, but we can load this cavity up with multiple solitons if we choose. You also can see that it's you know, pretty obvious that to make a practical device, it's necessary to actually put the laser frequency, the pumping frequency onto one of these steps and to hold it there and to hold it you know, very stably. And five years ago, this was quite challenging to do, but uh, within a few years, there were several techniques developed that involved, as you can imagine, elaborate servo controlling mechanisms uh, that you know, would put the pump where we want it to be and hold the pump at that position. So it became possible to do this conveniently in the laboratory. But what I'll show you in just a moment is that there's now very new techniques that have been just you know, invented in the last two years that for, you know, enable us to do this automatically. So it's just like turning on a light switch. We don't have to worry about anything in terms of you know, finding the step, holding the step, it all happens, okay, without any kind of servo control. Coming back to the Lugiato-Lefebvre equation for just a moment, uh, this turns out to be a really powerful 
uh, numerical simulation tool. And I'll just kind of show you that here. This is a numerical simulation of a single soliton. Here's the comb spectrum. And you can see it forming as a hyperbolic secant squared. And this is actually following a little soliton around in the cavity. And I run that one more time. So here's the spectrum. And we're in the frame of reference of the soliton. And you can see that little soliton form. And as we go deeper into the step, the soliton actually acquires more and more power. So this is how you regulate the power of the soliton and also the chrome bandwidth. It's the ESP tuning. All right. So that's the physics. And so now let's look at integration. All right. So I, um, first of all, uh, I'll show you some of the system demonstrations that have been realized that give you a lay, a, an idea of the level of integration that's now possible. But I want to come back to this business of actually how to turn on, trigger, and hold these solitons without you know, having to think about it, so to speak, without any servo control. And this is really a, quite a new result. Um, this is a result from a collaboration between the Bowers Group at UCSB, Kippenberg Group at EPFL, and my own group. And I'm uh, showing some of the results here. Uh, there's two main things I'd like to point out. One is that um, this is a fully packaged microcomb system. It's not self-reference, but it's a complete system in the sense that it has its own pump laser, 3.5 pump laser. It has a microwave rate uh, comb on board. Uh, they're all you know, packaged together. They now are hybridly integrated. This is all done hybridly integrated. And this was supported they were just sort of positioned next to each other. Um, there's no isolator on board here. They actually do not have an isolator, so that's kind of a nice thing, and I'll explain why that is in just a moment. But it's all pigtailed, and so essentially it's a, it's a fully functional little microfilm. Now, the other key point is that, as I mentioned, there's no isolator between this is the comb resonator and this is the pump laser. So normally in the early days, I mean, you know, just over two years ago, well, six years ago, we'd isolate all right, between these two. But we found actually it's better not to isolate. And in fact, actually the presence of the care effect feeding back into the cavity does something very interesting. And so coming back to this bi-stability curve, you can see down here, previously the way I set up the problem, okay, you know, when I showed you the movie before, this little dashed line that you see here was vertical. I was literally scanning the detuning. And as we moved into the bi-stability regime, we had an ambiguity, okay? There would be a, uh, a problem. If I tried to trigger the soliton, I might get a soliton, I might not get a soliton. You know, the laser wouldn't know where to be. Um, actually, now, as a result of the presence of the care effect coupled with the cavity, that line, which you can almost think of as kind of like a load line, is now pitched to the side. And actually, there's one, only one operating point. And uh, that, in combination with the, the locking that occurs upon uh, feedback, um, means that once we turn on the pump laser, the whole system snaps into alignment and immediately begins to produce solitons. And so this shows you that happening over here. Here we're just turning on the laser. This is the soliton power. This was a K-band soliton. You can see the frequency that we're measuring here. This is doing it repeatedly. We're turning it on, off, on, off. There's, there's you know, no control here. In fact, actually the temperature even drifts a little bit. Uh, and so you don't, don't need you know, much temperature control. And so this is a brand new thing. It's tremendously simplified, actually, the operation, uh, you know, and the integration of okay, these little microcomps. To do the style of solitons, uh, if you work with solitons, I'm sure you're familiar with these. These are called dark solitons. These are um, kind of like the reverse, okay, of a uh, inverse of a bright soliton. Bright solitons need anomalous dispersion to form. Dark solitons can be formed with normal dispersion. And uh, they have a, a funny looking spectrum. They're not hyperbolic secant. They kind of look like this. And you can think of them more as like square waves. And uh, they have some really intriguing and important properties. They're much more power efficient. And so a lot of the work that we're doing right now is actually focused on these dark solitons. But this is showing you some of the, uh, the comb or the uh, dispersion spectra, okay, for the mode spec or mode, mode family we're using to form the solitons. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention, and this is also really new, this is, uh, again, work between uh, John Bauer's group and, and my group. Um, these are, I think, this is really, I think is gonna have a huge effect, uh, impact on the subject of, uh, of you know, high-Q microcavities. Uh, these um, you know, resonators we're using for these microcombs are not processed in my lab. They're not processed in John's lab. They're actually processed in a foundry, uh, a CMOS foundry. And, 
the, uh, the tools have now been developed, and this is a, a, basically a 200 millimeter wafer uh, that contains a lot of different you know, kinds of waveguides, but we're zooming in on some resonators that are on board here. And, um, and you can see the kind of distribution, I think I've got over here, so here's the wafer. This is a Q map, and you can see that most of the resonators, there were 72 tested here all over the wafer, have Qs over 200 million. There's other work, okay, where this, these Qs are now up you know, to over 400 million, and they're rising. And uh, what this does is it means we now have a mass-produced, you know, CMOS-compatible technology that's allowing us to create, you know, high-Q resonators. And not only that, these resonators allow us to go on uh, and make, you know, dark solitons. And so this is a big, you know, technological step that's going to, um, I, you know, I think really be useful, certainly in the microchrome subject. Um, I just mentioned real quickly that the feedback process between the pump laser and these little cavities also line narrows, okay, the, uh, the 3.5 pump dramatically, taking its short-term line width all the way down to between a hertz and 10 hertz. And the coherent pumping process combined with that line narrowing transfers that ultra-narrow line across the comb spectrum. And so this is data where we're showing that, you know, the comb lines themselves actually have the, are, are carrying all of this nice coherence. And so this is really important for a WDM or coherent uh, you know, transmission systems. All right, so let's look at systems and uh, the last you know, part of the talk here. Um, okay, so not surprisingly with all of the you know, success that this uh, field has had in the last five or six years and, um, and you know, and it's just kind of an indicator of, of level of interest, but you know, six years ago, there were only, you know, one or two groups, okay, that could make soliton microcopes films. And if you look around the world now, there are 16 groups, okay, that are actually fabricating, um, you know, microcombs on, you know, all the, you know, the, you know, the Russia, Asia, Europe, okay, US, everywhere. And um, essentially, Everybody, you know, is uh, is having success in doing this, you know, in, in different platforms and you know, different interesting ideas they're exploring. Um, but you know, one of the important developments has been that uh, the tabletop application space, which you know was already well developed uh, five years ago, you know, kind of hinted at that. You know, hinted at the importance of comb technology for spectroscopy. I just talked about data transmission. There's a whole set, you know, I talked about synthesis, about clocks, but there's a whole spectrum of applications out there. LIDAR, there's a special type of LIDAR called dual comb LIDAR, combines the best of time of flight and interferometry. There's a whole subject that the astronomers are very excited about called astrocombs that was introduced about 10 years ago. We found ourselves embedded in this subject, uh, working with astronomers, transferring, you know, microcomb technology, okay, uh, that's being used at the Keck Observatory and, and at Palomar, okay, in the search for uh, exoplanets. And, um, and so this has happened really quickly. And so the good news is that the performance of the little microcombs is, you know, on par, okay, with the, uh, with the prior comb technology, the tabletop comb technology. And so it's giving us a pathway to miniaturization. Um, one other exciting feature, though, of the little microcombs is that actually their size, their tiny size, uh, naturally lends itself to extremely high repetition rate. Um, like microwave rates, K-band rates, millimeter wave rates are sort of naturally occurring in these little combs. And those are rates that are difficult to access with the larger tabletop combs because of their physical size. And these rates turn out to be very useful in these four applications, okay? so. You know, K-band rates are ideal for the astronomers. They're very important in LIDAR because it involves uh, or it enables very rapid sampling of fast moving objects. So this was work in the Kippenberg group where they actually imaged a bullet, okay, using a couple of silicon nitride combs. Dual comb spectroscopy, very, very rapid spectral sampling is enabled. And I've already mentioned uh, data transmission. And so here it's kind of like the, the WDM channel space team is, is a better match. Okay, it's like a K-band, okay, millimeter wave uh, band frequency that is easily accessed by, uh, by microcombs. But the, you know, the, the, the big, bigger news, I would say, okay, has happened over here. And uh, there's been a tremendous amount of interest in clock technology and synthesis technology 
and here there have been a couple of big programs that uh, one of them, this one in particular, is actually just finishing tomorrow. Okay, the, the final uh, deliverable on it, and I wish I had a nice picture of this. I'll show you kind of an earlier picture of it in just a moment. But this is a full synthesizer and uh, using microcombs. Um, this uh, program has run for five years and you can kind of see the schematic for it. This was out of the original proposal. This was led out of Santa Barbara. So a lot of credit for this goes to John Bowers group who kind of really you know, steered the whole effort in the right direction. But again, it's doing this. And so it's ideas radio to optical or microwave to optical and uh, synthesizing frequencies on demand. And, and this was actually possible. The, the early report on this was out just a couple of years ago. This was uh, uh, kind of showing the basic schematic over here. There's actually two microcombs that are used in this for reasons I don't have time to talk about, but here's the comb spectra. Here's the octave span. This was a silicon nitride comb right here. And a little dark band you can see in the middle, that's a, that's a microwave comb. That was one that we furnished to pay for this project. And this, like I said, this is a two-year-old image. I really have to replace it because it's a lot fancier now. I've seen the one that's going to be you know, presented um, you know, to DARPA. But it gives you the idea of the size scale. And I have to, th this has everything on board. There's the CMOS electronics, the pump lasers, the microcombs, all the controls. And uh, it basically is a functional um, you know, synthesizer. And um, it was tested in kind of an earlier version at NIST a few years ago. And uh, this is data. Now, this is out of Scott Bittums and Scott Papp's group. They were on our team. And uh, for this test, what they did, you might wonder, how do you do this? Because I mean, you can see this was a pretty in interesting measurement. They're measuring optical frequencies, but they're doing it you know, at one to two hertz, okay, absolute you know, accuracy, precision here. And uh, so what they did is they actually took a maser they used the maser as the reference, and that was, so that was a microwave reference. They fed that maser into this little microcomb synthesizer, and then they took the same maser, they fed it into a, a tabletop synthesizer they, that was a fiber comb synthesizer, and they compared the fiber comb synthesizer against the microcomb synthesizer, and, uh, and then you get these you know, nice results. And here was something else they did, and there's a tremendous amount of other data that can you know, substantiate all this. You've got to look at the the paper to see it. But this one kind of gives you an idea, kind of a glimmer, okay, of what can now be done and what, you know, the future, I'd say, of instrumentation is going to be, you know, in 10 to 20 years, okay, maybe even sooner, you know, we'll go to the Thor Labs, you know, catalog, and we'll see little tiny devices that will be optical synthesizers, and you'll have this kind of capability uh, where we will, you know, program in, in this case, they were programming in little 16 hertz shifts using a graphical user interface, okay, on this, uh, on this synthesizer. And, uh, and you have to remember, this is not relative, this is absolute. So you'll type in 14 significant figures, okay, on your synthesizer, and it will essentially emit an optical wave, okay, that is a sine wave at that frequency. So this is gonna be a very, very exciting new technology to have in the laboratory. And then along with that, of course, there's been interest in the clocks, the clock technology is a little bit behind, okay, in terms of, of uh, you know, the synthesizer. This was an early clock demo using a rubidium two-photon transition and uh, worked really well, okay. The uh, paper on that is out uh, just a couple, you know, two years ago. And uh, actually there's now, you know, programs running where that thermal rubidium cell has actually been replaced with a uh, cold atom clock. and so. There'll be some reports out on the cold atom clock uh, results in the next uh, next year, and those are looking real good too. All right, so that's where I, I want to stop and now look at uh, kind of where does this leave us, and um, I'm going to have you know kind of my outlook as I indicated when I started the talk. I mean, sort of near term, long term. All right, so first of all, uh, the one thing that you know, despite you know the excitement, I think that everyone has that is working on uh, you know, microcombs in terms of its technological impact, you have to be mindful of the fact that actually there is a pre-existing technology out there, which are, uh, you know, the conventional frequency combs, which themselves are really- Sorry to interrupt, Carrie. Maybe, yeah. could you wrap up in maybe one minute? We have yeah, sure I can. Yeah, yeah, Grace, yeah, sure. Hang on a second here. Yep. So basically, uh, short term, 
okay, is that this little miniature technology is not going to replace those commercial devices, but it's going to actually, you know, find little places, little, you know, places to go, niches really, uh, where size, weight, and power are important. And I'm showing you two here. Okay, so one, okay, probably astronomy. There's already, you know, groups that are thinking about astrocombs in space, okay, for exoplanet research. And the other, okay, clocks in space. And it turns out this is a really natural fit because we already do that, all right, for GPS. And so this is kind of a vision of a constellation of these optical clocks. And if you put them up there, you not only can improve the GPS system, but there's actually a lot of big science that can be done, which is you can kind of see in this diagram. And then the other, and then I'll, I'll finish here, the other kind of longer term picture, and this comes back to the overall theme of the talk, is that you know, for many, many years, all right, what we've had, uh, many decades really, you know, as I indicated, optics and electronics have been really largely isolated. Uh, that started to change with the chains, but actually that isolation was broken, okay, 20 years ago with frequency chromes. And now the, the interesting, you know, question for the future is that, you know, as we see microchrome technology provide really a coherent bidirectional link that's going to be chip scale, you know, what's going to happen? And I think it's pretty clear that, you know, we'll be engineering circuits in the future in a much more coherent way or a unified way, okay, where you know the optical side and the electrical side will be fused together. And so this itself, I think, is going to probably launch entirely new okay, technologies. But that's going to take a while. I think that's more of a long-term picture. And so with that, I'm going to conclude. And uh, I just want to thank you know, everybody that's been involved in this work, many of the collaborators, obviously our sponsors, and then also, you know, again, thank uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to be here, the, the student chapter at the University of Toronto. And, um, and you know, here's a couple of interesting reviews, okay, on, one on microcombs and the other on frequency combs in case you want to dive into this a little more deeply. So I'll stop there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the very exciting and informative talk. Um, people are cheering <laughs> on <laughs> virtually with their silent applause. <laughs> um, uh, it's a bit philosophical. <laughs> anyway, right. If we clap, it, is it really a clap now? <laughs> anyway, so, um, so we will, yeah, we would be taking questions and um, uh, yeah, Professor Pahala has time, so we will, we can go over time, it's not a problem. So I'll, please type your questions in the chat and I'll, um, I can call on you if you want to speak up, that's fine. Uh, if not, I can also ask for you. So the first question comes from Lee, Lee Chen. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. Hi. Thanks very much uh, for, for a really great talk, a uh, very informative and educational. Um, I have a question about the uh, stability. I know, you know, for, for the Moloch lasers, uh, there, there are two frequencies that you need to stabilize. One is the cavity length and the other one is the, the goo velocity, phase velocity, the dispersion. Right. How, how does that, uh, it, how was that implemented in the, this microcomb? Yeah, yeah. So, no, you've hit on really one of the, you know, the, the tricky things, okay, in the self-referencing that was done because, yeah, I mean, in the, in the larger devices, it was worked out real quickly how you could have these two knobs, right, right, to control repetition rate and then also to control F0. So it's kind of interesting. In the, in the microcombs, the F0, okay, is actually the easier one because essentially what you do is you simply tune the pump laser. And as you mm -hmm. tune the pump laser, the overall comb spectrum okay, itself moves around because the pump is one of the comb teeth. I and see. then the repetition rate, okay, well there what you can do is you can actually, you can change the refractive index, all right? So you, you heat, you can heat, okay, feedback okay. to the, the temperature or use a little bit of care nonlinearity to actually tune it. But there's nonetheless, okay, some coupling, okay, between those two knobs. They're not mm -hmm. completely you know, independent. And so you have to have, you know, some, you know, kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, electrical, you know, control, okay, that allows you to sort of, you know, orthogonalize those two, uh, two mechanisms. And so it, it was not, I would, you know, I wasn't involved in the early self-referencing of the tabletop devices, obviously, but that was a really tricky thing to work out, okay, in the synthesizer. It was one of the, you know, you know kind of, uh, I would say, surprise problems, okay, in, in the device. More recently, okay, so this is kind of a really recent development, but these devices where we feedback, 
okay, you know, to the pump. And so we have this sort of what we call turnkey mode of operation. There it gets a little easier, as it turns out, because what we have is the, the feedback phase, okay, between the cavity and the pump laser. There's no isolation. So we can electrically tune the feedback phase by putting, for example, a phase control section on the 3.5 chip. Mm -hmm. And that gives us fast tuning control of the laser frequency and therefore the F0. And then what you can do is you can put, you know, power modulation, right? You can just control the return path, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, attenuation. And that gives us the other control knob we need, okay, to actually vary the, the repetition rate. So you've got sort of like two natural built-in control knobs, okay, in, in that sort of system. So, so that one looks like it's, you know, heading in, you know, an easier, you know, control direction for the future. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that is a really, um, you know, that, that was a tricky thing to work out, I would say, you know, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, there's another question from uh, Kristen Colt. Yeah. That. Yes. Hi. Sure. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. I was just wondering what sets the shape of the comb or like the intensity of each tooth of the comb. Yeah. Okay. So the, um, all right. So give you, I'll give you three, okay, different versions. Okay. So start with the one that is, if you look at the comb, micro comb literature right now, that's the one you'll see most of the time. Um, it's a hyperbolic secant squared. And, uh, and so I had those little, you know, spectra up earlier. And um, they really are phenomenal. I mean, they are real, you can check them over five, six orders of magnitude, and you've got this beautiful hyperbolic secant squared. And that just comes about, okay, from actually having primarily second order uh, dispersion, okay, on the mode family that's, uh, you know, forming the solid time. And it drops right out of the blue shadow lefebvre equation. So there's like perfect agreement, okay, there. Now, if I go back just to chart here, maybe I can, uh, you know, just do this. And, me uh, jump back right here. Okay, there is another feature, okay, that pops up. And so here, this is a hyperbolic secant squared. Okay, if you can see that in the diagram. But you see these little wings over here. And these are not part of the soliton, but this is a very important trick that was developed in the last few years uh, that we've borrowed actually from fiber optics. Um, and this is adding uh, higher order dispersion into the cavity. And so we'll add in third order dispersion, even fourth order dispersion. And, uh, and what happens is that you can kind of bend the shape, okay, of the mode spectrum out in the wings of the soliton. And so in here, the dispersion looks second order. So you see like a parabola, but out here, the parabola turns around. And as it turns around, there's a crossing point over here where there's a pickup in energy. And this is what's, you know, these dispersive waves, okay, are formed there. And they allow the little soliton comb to throw coherent power out into these wings. And, and the reason that's done is that that makes the self-referencing process really you know, much, much easier. So this is another, another kind of feature, okay, that you'll see in the comb spectra. And then finally, I'd have to go back. I can't even, maybe I can't go back far enough. But the other kind of spectrum, and you can kind of figure out what this looks like real quickly. But the dark solitons, um, that's, so these are all bright solitons. The dark solitons are more like square waves. And, uh, and so if you take the Fourier transform of a, of a periodic square wave, um, that is what you will see, okay, in the comb spectrum. So it's not, it is a sort of a regular, you know, kind of uh, look to it. I had one of them up a little earlier, but, but those are the three, you know, kinds of shapes, okay, that you will see in the literature. Hyperbolic sequence squared, hyperbolic secant squared with these little wings, these dispersive wave wings, and then these sort of strange, I don't know how to, you know, how to dis you describe them, but they're like the square wave for the uh, spectra. And uh, so if you check the literature, that's what you'll see. And that's why they look that way, basically. So. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. So next, uh, there's a question from Eric. Eric Chu. Would you like to ask your question? Oh, no, Mike. Okay. So I will ask. Um, so Eric is a postdoc um, in Toronto. So he has uh, two questions. The first is, um, would you have to, do you have to compensate for the dispersion of the waveguide cavities uh, so that the, um, uh, F, the repetition rate to FSR ratio remains constant? Um. 
the uh, oh oh I see yeah is that the that the dispersion yeah. have to be managed yeah yeah, yeah no um, yeah so it's interesting but yeah the, uh, the the answer is that we we have to we need to be we need to pay attention okay to dispersion and so I mean there's this whole little you know kind of uh, you know name now that you hear thrown around a lot about dispersion engineering inside the micro cavity and um, and so you do have to worry about it all right but inevitably you know there's always there's always misalignment okay of the uh, you know the natural frequencies of the resonator as a result of dispersion relative to those perfectly spaced you know comb lines and uh, and in some sense you know kind of understanding you know what is it that determines the spectral extent of the comb itself it's actually that sort of misalignment okay that starts to occur between those you know where the energy is at in the soliton comb for example you know where it needs to be as a result of you know, lying on a perfectly evenly spaced or equally spaced grid of frequencies, where that grid is and where the actual frequencies of the resonator are at. And so for second order, you know, anomalous dispersion, um, you know, the, the resonator frequencies are, are walking off, all right, from the soliton comb. And the further away you go from the pump, the more they're walking away. And, uh, and that walk off is really what's limiting the bandwidth. Right, of the comb, and so I'm, I've got this one little picture I'm showing you right here. So here's a here's a little soliton comb. There's a couple little hiccups in it you see here, but the overall spectral width of that, okay, the fact that these are dying down out here, it's a result of the fact that actually there's this misalignment going on because of the built-in dispersion. Right. So so now you know that, and what do you do? Well, you you can reduce the second-order dispersion, and you try to pull back on it. And as you pull back on the second-order dispersion, the comb will broaden and uh and so this you know control of that second order dispersion reduction of it you know trying to take it as close to zero as possible gives you one knob you know that you can use to actually broaden the comb unfortunately right unfortunately there's noise i mean there's actually just there's noise in the dispersion and so that little trick you know has a limit you can't you know take it as far as you necessarily might want to or as far as you, you think you can but um but, but, you know, to answer your question, yeah, there's a walk-off and the walk-off, you know, it kind of a you know, hand-waving level is really what, you know, kind of is setting the, uh, the spectral extent of the, uh, of the soliton in this case. In fact, the, you know, these little wings that I mentioned down here, you know, that are these dispersive waves, you know, that's another way to understand what's going on there that, you know, you've got, again, if you can imagine the dispersion curve, it's doing this, it's a parabola right in here and then the higher order dispersion pitches it back around and so out here at this point and at this point the soliton comb power is now becoming resonant again it's becoming really strongly resonant okay with some modes that you've kind of pulled back in all right by introduction of this higher order dispersion and now the you know the, the comb can throw power okay the soliton can throw power out okay into these lines those lines are not, by the way, they're not part of the solution of Lugia de Lefebvre equation. They're, they're just acting as a load. Right? They're like a new loading mechanism on the soliton. So it's like you're throwing in some kind of resonant system out there that's you know, pulling power okay, out of the soliton and its wings. And uh, you, so it does you shape the resonator at all to, to, yeah, to, to that's right. adjust your dispersion? You can do, that's exactly what you can do. You can do all sorts of little interesting tricks. Okay, you can shape the resonator you can introduce you know so the one of the ways we do this is we have geometrical dispersion that we can you know throw in the aspect ratio i mean some of the really you know sort of simple things that are easy to you know implement in a um, a fab just the thickness and width of the waveguide you know what is that aspect ratio that actually controls okay these dispersion parameters geometrical dispersion parameters you can put a tilt okay on one of the you know the facets that will you know change uh, things you can change the width of the guide you could introduce another resonator. There's a very recent paper just out last month from a group in Sweden. Um, this is, uh, you know, um, uh, you know the group at uh, Chalmers, and uh, they're basically taking two resonators. Okay, so two micro cavities, letting them couple together, and then there's a set of whispering gallery resonators that actually, you know, will couple together. And what this does is it allows them to create a local region of dispersion that enables the triggering of dark solitons. So there's a whole 
you know, kind of uh, call them geometrical, configurational, you know, range of games uh, that can be played to engineer dispersion and, uh, and then use that to, you know, to modify what's going to happen with the soliton. Um, and so, you know, kind of a fun area, okay, in its own right, in terms of, uh, you know, the um, you know, kind of physics and engineering, okay, sort of uh, working hand in hand there. And the second question from Eric, and it might be also illuminating for all the students in the audience, is there a difference between a ring resonator mode and a whispering gallery mode? Yeah, that's a, yeah, okay, so um, it depends on who you talk to, <laughs> okay, I guess. Um, in, in, uh, in principle, all ring resonators are whispering gallery, all right, and so everything with a turn in it, all right, uh, that involves a dielectric is a whispering gallery. Now, why is that? Um, well, okay, the, uh, the whispering galleries, uh, you know, kind of the, you know, the acoustical definition, uh, you know, goes back a, you know, a century ago, and it's, it's literally a, a guided mode, okay, around a hard boundary, okay. Um, you know, the, you know, any of the, you know, St. Uh, Paul's Cathedral, okay, is the famous, it's the whispering gallery, all right. Um, the modern sense of whispering gallery in optics uh, kind of the qualifying, you know, uh, characteristic, at least in my, my way of looking at it, is that it's quasi-total internal reflection. It's not perfect total internal reflection. So perfect total internal reflection, of course, is what happens when you have a, a flat interface, you know, high dielectric to low, or high index, low index, you're coming from the high index side, you get 100% reflection, okay, uh, you, know, at, you know, beyond the critical angle. You curve that interface a little bit so that you're now in the whispering gallery and now you've got the mode that's sort of arching around and if you look at the wave equation what you can see is that the wave is tunneling it actually is it, it, it leaks and uh, and so when we say whispering gallery and in, in dielectric resonators uh, what I'm thinking about all the time is that I've got a structure that's not a perfect resonator it's actually leaking all the time it's leaking just a little bit of light because it's tunneling there's a tunneling gap there and, um, and if you make that resonator too small, or if the index contrast is too low, the tunneling rate becomes dominant and it determines the Q factor. And so we're always designing resonators, okay, either with high enough index contrast from the core to the cladding, or we're making the radius large enough, all right, so that actually that, uh, that tunnel leakage is not the dominant effect. And, you know, typically, you know, it's, it's easy to do. I mean, you know, in a, you know, like a silicon nitride structure, like what I've been showing you here today in oxide or in oxide air, you know, uh, typically that leakage rate is going to be, you know, giving you cues that are above a trillion, right? So you don't even worry about it. Um, but you can make the structures. It's easy to fabricate, you know, whispering gallery structures that are so small that they're completely dominated by tunnel leakage. But that, in my mind, okay, just as, you know, practitioner, um, that's the distinguishing characteristic of an optical whispering gallery is it's, it's not perfect. It's, it's always leaking a little bit because of this, uh, you know, tunnel leakage. So, so yeah, it's an interesting question. And, uh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for the, oh, thank you for the answer, Eric says. So, um, so with that, uh, since we're over time, I think um, it'll be very good to, to wrap up and um, let us all thank uh, Professor Vahal again for this really exciting and inspiring uh, talk. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> we'll clap. Um, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> okay, All right. All right. Um, so um, I, I guess Joyce, you're you're staying. Uh, yeah. I will. Okay, and I'll I'll join later then. Um, you're at four fifteen, right? Yeah, I'm at four fifteen. So okay. I'll join later. I'll okay. make sure that the the call so, is active. So, so Lee, I should just come back to this Zoom Zoom link right here around the four fifteen your time. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. We'll okay. Do. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. See you okay. in a little while. Yeah. Bye. Okay. I guess um, maybe the one issue of using the same call is that we still have a few people hanging on here. I can remove everybody. Uh, just give me a moment. And also, please turn off the recording. <laughs> oh yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you.